Hi friends, welcome to another edition of the Why on Earth Communities Stewardship and Sustainability Podcast Series. I'm here with Brigitte Mars. Hi Brigitte. Hi, wonderful to be here. And it is such a joy to have this opportunity to visit with you today, Brigitte. Uh, Brigitte is a teacher of herbal medicine and natural healing using the power of plants and has taught students all over the world. She has also written several books. Is it 14 books? 14 books mm -hmm. at this point, um, including The Home Reference to Holistic Health and Healing, The Natural First Aid Handbook, The C Country Almanac of Home Remedies, The Desktop Guide to Herbal Medicine, Beauty by Nature, Addiction Free Naturally, which is an amazing resource, the Sexual Herbal, also an amazing resource. Healing Herbal Teas, Rawsome. I mean, it goes mm -hmm. on and on, Brigitte. And, and this is, these are such a rich set of resources, treasures really, for us to learn from. And I want to ask you something about the books in just a minute. But let me just finish by saying that you teach uh, at Naropa University, uh, the School of Health Mastery in Iceland. Uh, you've taught at the Omega Institute, Esalon, and the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and Brigitte, of course, you're also a mother and a grandmother. Uh, and it is such a joy and pleasure to be with you today. Thanks so much for being on our show. It's my pleasure and honor. Thank you. So I want to maybe start by asking, how did this all get started for you? I know that You've written all these books. You've taught so many hundreds, thousands of people. How did your connection with herbal medicine begin? Well, I was really blessed to have this French-Canadian grandmother, and she was very knowledgeable about the ways of healing with plants. Mm. And I would go visit her, and it was almost like going back a 100 years in time because she had a root cellar, and she made soap in a big cauldron in the, in the yard, and... She had chickens in the yard, and her idea of ice cream was to put maple syrup, which we made out in the forest with the, these lumberjacks, and then we would pour it on snow, and that was la crème glacée. And um, so by the time I was in uh, high school, I knew that I wanted to study more about herbal medicine. I did not like getting shots as a child, and because I went to camp every summer, there was all oh, these shots, and it was very stressful to me. And, you know, I felt that the medicine that my grandmother was promoting, things like garlic and cabbage and apple cider vinegar, I felt like this is medicine for the people. And my parents would like, why do you want to do these old wives' tales? That, that's something poor people did in the old country. And I felt like, yeah, but it works. And it's good for the planet because every time we decide to use a natural medicine, somewhere on the planet there's going to be a field of cabbage or lavender or echinacea rather than a you know, pharmaceutical company pumping smoke into the environment. Not, not to say that those things can't be life-saving. But mm -hmm. when I was in high school, every time I had a paper to do, I would turn it into an opportunity to learn about herbs. Yeah. So if it was, uh, you know, Spanish, I would write about uh, plantas medicinales de Mexico or uh, herbal medicine during the French Revolution. And so, um, and then I actually treated all my classmates rather than them going to the nurse. I had this drawer of, you know, rescue remedy and chamomile tea. And I was just a kid, but I was experimenting on my friends and it worked. A, a walking pharmacopoeia. I love it. And... You know, this is something that has been used by millions of people mm -hmm. for thousands of years. So yeah. when someone tries to say like, oh, herbal medicine hasn't really been tested, right. it's been tested a lot longer than a two-year rat study Yes, in my book. No doubt about that. For countless generations, and you know, one of the things that strikes me that I discussed a bit in the book Why on Earth toward the beginning actually is that we don't have to go back very many generations, regardless of who we are and where we happen to be living on the planet. We don't have to go back very many generations to find that in all of our ancestries, all of us shared, all of humanity uh, is a background and a past where we use herbal medicine. That was normal for so many hundreds and thousands of years. It is only in the last two or three generations where it is 
abnormal, where we have this aberration where for many people it's like herbal medicine, oh, what's that new fad or what's that strange fringe thing? But in fact, this is the norm. Right, there's nothing new age about it. It right. is ancient and in 1900 about 80% of all the pharmaceuticals were derived from plants. Mm -hmm. We had willow bark that came from meadow sweet and aspen and um, we had birth control pills that were derived from wild yam. Even mm. digitalis comes from the plant foxglove, which is toxic to use as a plant. But in 1917, um, there was a movement where they sent one man, um, the Flexner, Mr. Flexner, they sent him around to all the medical schools in the country, and he was supposed to make a deal with the medical schools that if they would only teach the new modern medicine, mm. they would get funding. Mm. And if they persisted in teaching about herbs and homeopathy, they wouldn't get funding. So in a few years, herbal medicine really died on the vine unless it was you know, still being used by tribes or people that live very close to the earth, certain religious groups. But in Europe, the herbs never got taken off the shelf. They've mm. always coexisted. And I feel we're blessed because if you were in an accident, you know, the modern care that the hospital can afford you is great. And I feel that the best of medicine is yet to come when we honor the natural remedies and put our heads and hearts together to also offer what technology is offering us. Absolutely. Yeah, that's such a beautiful, beautiful vision. You know, one of the things that uh, I love sharing, because like you, I'm busy uh, working on new writing projects, giving talks, consulting, and I have found that in order to maintain a good level of sustained energy, health, and well-being for myself, it's essential that I utilize some of the herbal medicines that are available, and I thought I'd bring some, Brigitte, for us to share together. So this is a tisane I made last night, and it has some beautiful organic and even biodynamic herbs including calendula, licorice root, peppermint, nettles, and some equisetum. Some of these were even grown at our friends biodynamic farm sustainable settings up in the Rocky Mountains and I thought it would be fun for us to uh, have a little while we're talking today. That sounds wonderful and those are all really great herbs so I love it. You know, when we're imbibing herbal teas, the plants transform the minerals of the earth into a way that we can readily assimilate them. So, my friend, my friend, to your health, blessed be, blessed be. Yum. Oh, it's wonderful. Licorice makes things just a little bit sweet. Yes. And one of the things I love about the licorice is because when I'm you know, giving talks or what have you, my throat can get raspy and the licorice helps to soothe that a bit. Right, great anti-inflammatory agent. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk maybe a little more about the nettles, right? Because I, I know that you have a few favorites in this whole pharmacopoeia and I have heard you say more than once that nettles is one of those favorites. So why, why is that? Well, nettles, um, well, Rudolf Steiner said about nettles, nettles are the heart of the world. That's a big statement coming yeah. from a pioneer such as Rudolf Steiner. And the belief and observation is that when plants that have a lot of essential oils grow near nettles, their essential oil content is higher. So plants like oregano and thyme and peppermint. But what I love about nettles is that it's so mineral rich, really high in iron, high in protein, high mm. in calcium, magnesium. It even contains the amino acid lysine, which um, is hard to get from vegetable foods, but has anti-herpatic properties. Um, a German woman gave me one nettle plant maybe 30 years ago, and I moved with it. And now there's 10,000 nettle plants there. And it provides constant food for us from March until maybe December. And, you know, you might have heard of stinging nettles, and this is the same plant, Urtica dioica. Um, it does sting you if you touch it, but uh, the getting stung with it is actually very therapeutic for arthritis and uh, pain, sore joints for you know people that use their hands a lot, the computer playing instruments. So the getting stung is actually very therapeutic and it's like a free remedy. Um, but I love nettles because it's very blood building. Mm -hmm. There was a study done 
in Portland where they found that it's very effective at alleviating the symptoms of hay fever, the runny eyes, the itchy runny nose and so forth. Um, and I love that the minerals in it can nourish our hair, our teeth, our bones. It's very alkalinizing mm. and it's edible. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, you can, uh, you know, I'm big on adding greens to everything. So yeah. if I were making gluten-free pancakes, I would blend nettles up in it. And my grandkids get to have superhero pancakes that are green. That's so um, great. If you're making muffins, if you're making uh, scrambled eggs, you could make green eggs, no ham. Uh -huh. That would make Dr. Seuss proud. <laughs> um, so whatever you are making, fortify it by adding more greens. And I think the American diet has gotten rather beige. So, you know, eat the rainbow, eat all the colors is yeah. always a good idea. One of the keys to health and well-being, eating the rainbow, the all the different colors of fruits and vegetables. I just mm -hmm. want to repeat that, reiterate that, because it's such an easy thing we can all do more of in our own lives, right at our fingertips, right? This doesn't take a massive lifestyle change. And you know, a lot of parents find it challenging to get their kids to eat healthfully. So, you know, go shopping with your kids and in the produce section, mind you, and then say, you need to pick out three red foods you're willing to eat and three yeah. orange foods and so forth. Because, you know, kids can relate to colors, but hey, if kids can do it, we can do it. Absolutely. That's cool. So you're giving them the choice. It's sort of like a new version of a kid in a candy shop, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. Well, you know, when I'm working with executives, organizational leaders, what I hear over and over is that they are doing things to enhance their level of performance, to really be at that, that top level, that A game as consistently as possible. And it, it, it strikes me that, oh my goodness, what an incredible opportunity we have uh, to utilize herbal medicines in our lives to sustain that level of performance and energy, creativity, leadership, that so many of us are, frankly, spending all kinds of money to try to cultivate in other ways. And I'm just struck, especially with the nettles patch outside of your home, uh, some of this is not only so simple to incorporate in our lives, but it is so delightful. Well, there's a whole classification of plants that are called adaptogens. They help the body adapt, and they can help the body adapt to stress, they might help you sleep if you need to sleep, but they might also give you more energy if you need more energy. And um, I'm finding a lot of high level professional people getting great benefits from using adaptogenic herbs like rhodiola or eleuthero, which used to be called Siberian ginseng. Also Chinese and American ginseng. Uh, holy basil or tulsi mm -hmm. is another one, schizandra berries. And uh, it's interesting that a lot of these plants, they adapt, they grow very well under difficult conditions. I was teaching in Iceland and I saw by the side of a cliff, rhodiola growing. And I thought the winds are whipping it and the sea foam is crashing upon it. And it's gonna be really hard to harvest this plant. Someone's gonna have to climb out on a ledge. And I thought, that's why this plant is so good for you because it survives the intense winds of Iceland, the mm. six months of almost total darkness and then total light. Um, and mm. these plants that adapt hold the secret to help our bodies adapt. And it, it seems that the cultural norm has been, you know, just drink coffee mm -hmm. for people that are, you know, having a lot of work to do. And, you know, coffee is an herb. I mm -hmm. don't have anything to say against it, but it doesn't provide us with the minerals that mm -hmm. we get from some of these adaptogenic plants. And so I'd like people to mix it up a little bit. And, yeah. you know, and I know coffee gives us energy, but it's like, taking money out of the bank account. Mm -hmm. Whereas I see these adaptogenic herbs like rhodiola and uh, eleuthero putting something in the bank account, meaning yeah. our creativity and life force and well-being. It's so beautiful. Well, and I know that a lot of my friends out there are coffee drinkers and I enjoy coffee myself, but this is not an either or kind of question. This can be for some of us a both and. And so I really enjoy having some coffee as well as some of this adaptogenic tea uh, throughout the day and especially later in the day so that I'm not uh, disrupting my sleep cycle too mm -hmm. terribly much with the caffeine and all of that. I wanted to go back to a thing you mentioned about the nettles, uh, that it's 
alkalizing. And can you tell us a little more about that, what that means and why that's so important? Well, there have been a number of books written about how important it is for our bodies to be more alkaline. And, you know, how do you know if you're more acid or alkaline? You can get these little uh, paper strips that you test. You can test your urine or your saliva. Um, and what we do know is that most Americans eat a lot of food that promotes a condition of acidity. And being more acidic can make us feel more lethargic, more depressed, uh, crave more addictive substances like more alcohol, more coffee, more sugar. And when we're more alkaline, which is going to occur when we eat more green leafy vegetables and fresh fruits, um, disease doesn't really proliferate in that type of condition. So there's all kinds of books and not every book agrees on what's acid and alkaline. But in general, we could say that sugar and dairy and meat and grains make us more acidic. Mm -hmm. And when we're more acidic, we're just going to be more likely to get that cold, that flu, be one of those people that gets cancer. Whereas if we're more alkaline, we're going to regenerate and feel brighter and more alive. So it's a real mm -hmm, simple mm -hmm. thing. And of course, it uh, changes from day to day. Mm -hmm. You know, if you test yourself and you're more acid, it could be that you had a big dessert last night or you drank three cups of coffee instead of one. Um, so it does change from day to day, but it also gives you ideas on, well, how do I get back on track? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. Uh, so many medical tests, they do change from day to day. So we have control. And what I'm trying to do with herbal medicine is really empower people to take more responsibility for their own health rather yes. than, yes. yes, it's great that you have a wonderful doctor. I'm so happy for you, but mm -hmm. he's not making food for you three meals a day unless you're married to him or her. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. So it's really up to you. <laughs> what can you do to make this easier? And so I like to empower people to be their their primary healthcare person, and then everything yes. else is secondary and tertiary. That is such a beautiful way to put this. I have recently been sharing with folks that in a sense, each one of us is a farmer, and we each have a farm in the form of our body where we're growing all kinds of organisms, and some of them are good for us, some of them not. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that as we keep our bodies more alkaline, it actually means that the uh, conditions, the environs inside of us are not as favorable for some of those pathogens that might make us sick. Well, it's interesting that Louis Pasteur, who's who promoted pasteurization, mm -hmm. where we have to heat everything to keep it sterile um, and, you know, constantly be using antimicrobial agents. At the end of his life, he said the terrain is everything. The terrain. The terrain the is earth. everything, huh. the earth. So it's not just about like, well, I shook someone's hand and they had a cold because we're always exposed to pathogens all day long. Yeah. Every time we get close to somebody, shake hands, hug, embrace, share, you know, a, a cup, mm -hmm. uh, pick up a pencil that someone else had. Mm -hmm. And so rather than thinking, oh, it's the pathogens that must all be annihilated, because mm -hmm. it's not possible. There are good bacteria and bad bacteria. Mm -hmm. And so if we have a healthy, strong terrain, then we're going to be able to uh, fight off the things that don't serve us. Oh, I love it. Well, it turns out we're talking about soil again. There you go. <laughs> All this it's so ties important. Back to soil. When you mentioned the leafy greens, one of the things that made me think of is is learning a while back in Brigitte, I think I may have first heard this from you, that the chlorophyll in uh, green plants, which is the molecule that allows the conversion of sunlight into um, usable uh, molecules that essentially feeds our biosphere, uh, that chlorophyll molecule is identical to the hemoglobin molecule that is in our blood with one difference that at the hemoglobin molecules center there is an iron atom and in the center of the chlorophyll molecule is a magnesium atom oh my gosh, it's as if we're in the same family. That's true, and you could think of chlorophyll as being like plant blood. Mm. And we also know that chlorophyll, which we're gonna find in everything from kale to spinach to arugula to dandelion greens, um, helps our bodies not only to be more alkaline, but also to better utilize oxygen mm -hmm. and to help wound healing time and help us to be more resistant to infection. So mm -hmm. um, even though I really saying eat all the colors, there's something especially medicinal about the green plants and um, mm -hmm. you know, all of the, we also know that 
the, the green plants of our planet are also providing oxygen for us to breathe. And mm -hmm. that's why, you know, I feel so strongly that we should all be growing something rather than just having a rock yard, you know, plant something to yeah. help oxygenate our cities because yeah. this is where we really need it. Absolutely. Well, speaking of the cities, um, it seems to me that if we're going to get uh, more and more focused on this idea of having space colonies or uh, living on the moon or on Mars or something like that, I know this is a discussion emerging more and more. It strikes me that, by golly, if we're going to be terraforming some of these utterly hostile environments, why don't we practice and terraform the cities we've got now because they are actually pretty harsh environments also. Mm -hmm. And it's basically going to boil down to soil and, and growing these plants, whether we're in a high rise apartment or a sub suburban uh, home with a yard. We could be growing all manner of medicinal herbs, couldn't we? Absolutely. Um, I have an article that was on Huff Huffington Post, and it's now online. It's called "Get Off Your Grass and Create an Edible Lawn." Mm -hmm. And you know, the <laughs> idea that we are spending a third of our nation's water supply to water grass, uh, yeah. which is a crop that most humans don't eat. Maybe your pet goat does, but you know, how many of us have a pet goat in the yard? I don't think too many. Um, <laughs> But we're wasting our water and we can't continue to, to disrespect water, right. especially the way the population has increased. Yes. And what if that same amount of water or even a fraction of that amount of water was used to grow things like chickweed and dandelion and malva and yeah. purslane, which was Gandhi's favorite food. Huh. So there's been this um, American thought that like weeds are the enemy and you're not a good citizen if you have mm -hmm. dandelions in your yard. And yet dandelions help aerate the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, the leaves are edible. The flowers are high in lutein, which benefits our eyes. Farmers have long said that where the dandelions grow, that's a great place to put the garden. So we need to change our thinking mm. that spraying herbicides yeah. is an American way of life because that is bad. Even if you think you're only spraying your yard, the rain, the winds, it ends up migrating. It ends up killing the bees that's right. and the bees pollinate. I've heard like three out of every four bites of food we Billions eat. Billions of dollars worth every year. And Billions. so we cannot yeah. continue this practice and we know that there's some really, you know, uh, maybe we thought this was a good idea. I mean, I grew up during the better living through chemistry slogan, mm, mm, mm. but we're needing to rethink that. And, you know, anything with the word side in it, herbicide, yeah, pesticide, yeah. Um, we do not need to be spraying that in our yard where our children play, our yeah. pets yeah. cavort. And, and to rethink the way we look at the weeds because um, I made breakfast this morning and everything that was in our breakfast was growing five minutes before we were eating mm. it. Mm. I harvested kale and what was left of the dandelion greens and the vitality you feel from eating things that are so fresh, yes. they were just growing. You can't buy that at the store. Right. And I really think we've been bamboozled. Mm -hmm. You know, everything we buy and eat, it's got to have a barcode and a sticker on it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really advocating like, what can you plant? What can you grow? We can all grow something. That's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. So maybe we'll, we'll start planting the seeds for a, uh, a, a no code movement uh, <laughs> around some of these things that we're eating. You know, uh, I remember hearing recently that in some of our ancient traditions, uh, we actually have awareness of the uh, degree of life force in food called prana, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that you're often eating plants that were just growing a few minutes prior means that there is a much higher level of prana and life force, which is driving our health and well-being, isn't it? It's so true. And if you think about it, how many people are buying iceberg lettuce that's mm. trucked in from another country or another state, yep. although in the winter it might be trucked in from another continent. Mm -hmm. And how long ago was that plant in the ground? Yeah. And so I've heard uh, bringing iceberg lettuce from California is a very expensive way to ship water. Right. And so, yeah. you know, again, the darker chlorophyll is going to indicate even more minerals. So if you're mm -hmm. eating some kind of white green rather than like something dark and rich, mm -hmm. you're, you're missing out. 
and we just it's just a shift in consciousness and yes. we're all helping that yeah. and we're yeah. all here for you to help you shift and we just need to re-educate our neighbors but when you see those pesticides applied sign like that that cannot be a, the good neighbor of the future it's not and housing associations and homeowners yeah. associations they need to change their strategies because anything that's contributing to the destruction of our bees and our soil and our water and our air that's not for Absolutely. the benefit of humankind. Absolutely. And, and Brigitte, just to that end and on that note, I want to mention uh, for our viewers and audience that with respect to engaging in these practices for greater stewardship, sustainability, health, and well-being, there are incredible resources available, including the 14 books that Brigitte has written. And you can find those at BrigitteMars.com. It's B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E-M-A-R-S.com. And I'll just drop a little uh, something in there for the esotericists out there. You might be interested to note that the plant Nettles, according to Rudolf Steiner, uh, had an affiliation with the planet Mars. And uh, you'll see on the uh, Tree of Life, the Kabbalah, some very interesting things to check out there if you are so inclined. I also want to mention that um, if you would like to, you can use the code PODCAST to get discounts on the audiobook and ebook resources at whyonearth.org slash market. Uh, so that's something that uh, we want to make sure you guys use. However, there is also a very special code you can use if you would like to, which is Brigitte Mars. And if you use that special code Brigitte Mars at the Why on Earth website, you'll get discounts on products and some other nifty goodies. So we want to make sure you know about that. And uh, I just want to come back now to the dandelion for another moment because one of the things that in all these different plants growing in our neighborhoods, maybe in our yards, that some of us might have been applying uh, pesticides to dandelion is in particular is is an essential early uh, spring food for the honeybees and they are so essential to our ecosystem tell us a little more about that and and taking care of honeybees and dandelions and all of that well the dandelions were deliberately brought here mm. by the pioneers they planted them because dandelions are one of the top five most nutritious vegetables and the pioneers put fences around the dandelions, you know, just like with everything else, to keep the deer and the rabbit and other creatures out because that was a food plant. Mm. And um, dandelion leaves are edible. In the Jewish tradition, they were originally one of the bitter herbs of Passover. Oh, wow. uh, the dandelion stems, you can boil like noodles. Mm -hmm. The flowers are edible. I've made dandelion smoothies, dandelion loaf. I have a whole ebook out called Dandelion Medicine, so we didn't even mention that book. Check that out. Um, and dandelion root is also edible, and it helps to detoxify the liver. It's good for skin ailments. So um, how did this plant ever get so maligned? Yeah, like, it's yeah. such a great plant. And again, I think it's a lot of marketing. that We're being sold a bill that says, you know, you need to get these chemicals and have this antiseptic pea green lawn. I feel like it's an oppression of the wild yeah. and the feminine. Yes. We need to control and dominate nature and keep giving her like a crew cut all the time. Mm -hmm. That sells more gasoline, doesn't it? M hey, millions of gallons of yeah. gasoline per year to mow lawns. And, and yeah. it's really toxic. It smells bad. Like here mm -hmm. you are trying to sleep in maybe a little bit Sunday morning and 7 mm -hmm. o'clock. You know, it, yeah. you know yeah. it, so maybe we should think about how we do our lawns. But the dandelion is so useful. Um, you can roast the root and it tastes mm -hmm. a lot like coffee. Mm -hmm. It's a great herb medicinally. It's, as I said, it's also alkalinizing like the nettles are. And th this whole idea that uh, dandelions are somehow indicate that you're a low class citizen or something, mm. I think that really came from uh, a, a sort of prejudice against foreigners. 
You know, oh, like, wow. hey, it's America. And Americans shop at the store and they buy new mm. modern food, yep. boil in a bag kind of vegetables and prepackaged food. So it's, you know, again, we're all doing our best and we're all yeah. very influenced by the media. And that's why mm -hmm. it's so important to do a show like this to really say uh, the dandelions are not the enemy. Maybe we really need to think about um, these chemicals that are poisoning our planet. But uh, dandelions are so useful and not only to humans, but uh, for the soil because mm -hmm. they aerate the soil. They make nutrients more available for other plants. And, you know, we were talking about plants that adapt. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. dandelion adapts. It survives people walking on it. It survives dogs peeing on it. It can grow through the cracks and the sidewalks. Yeah. It, it, it grows before the snows are even, you know, complete. Mm -hmm. um, it can survive all kinds of adversity. They've tried to kill it, tried to kill it. It keeps shape-shifting ever wow. so little. You wow. mow it down and it just grows back shorter next season. So talk about adaptogens. They don't have to come from Siberia or Iceland. We've got adaptogens saying, use me, use me lots, I'm right here, yeah. you know? And I feel like the dandelion really is a symbol of this uh, realigning with nature and yeah. becoming a partner with nature. And all those seeds that proliferate, I mean, this plant, it's doing great things. And I think a lawn with dandelions in it is so yeah. much inter more Beautiful. interesting for our kids to play in. You could make a wish and uh -huh. blow those little <laughs> seeds around and... Yeah, it's delightful that way. And it strikes me that uh, these plants, dandelion, are so resilient, persistent, intelligent, adaptable. Reminds me a lot of our species. And in a sense, connecting with the dandelion for each of us is an opportunity to connect back more with our own heritages and the longer versions of our human story on the planet. That sounds like, to me, a lot of fun. And, you know, the, the French call dandelion pis en lit, which means pee in the bed, because mm. dandelion's a, a diuretic, and it's as effective a diuretic as one of the leading diuretic drugs. Mm. Well, why aren't the studies being done on dandelion? And another thing about those uh, leading drugs is they deplete your body of potassium. Mm. So a good doctor will say, here's this drug, now go get some potassium. But dandelions give you potassium. Oh, but who's going to you know, release dandelion as a drug when they've got us buying chemicals to eradicate them. Mm -hmm. It's a bit nefarious in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So we just need to, come on everybody, wake up, we're here to help. Yeah. Um, and you, and the nature, nature's like offering you something free that's gonna help yeah. you adapt. Yeah. Well, I just believe and, and am so overjoyed every day that we live on this miraculous planet, Brigitte, and there's, there's no accident that we refer to this planet as a mother, Mother Earth, Gaia, in traditions all over the world. And speaking of the relationship with the feminine and with nature, uh, there's another very special plant that I've heard you speak about before, which is the hemp plant, the cannibosum. And I've heard you talk about this plant as the great mother. Uh, this is a plant that has extraordinary healing properties for ourselves, for the landscapes and ecosystems. And uh, it's amazing to watch right now that this plant is suddenly transforming back into a central part of our way of being here in this culture. That change is happening. And uh, so good, uh, by golly, it, it's something we need to see more and more of. And Brigitte, why is this hemp plant one of your favorites? Well, I'm always looking for plants that can help the planet. And when I think about hemp, mm -hmm. um, here's a plant that we could be making fuel out of mm -hmm. that, that's renewable rather than fracking our neighborhoods. Wow, that one really makes me mad. Mm -hmm. um, we could be making fabric out of hemp. Right now, one of the most pesticided crops on the face of the earth is cotton. Yeah. And since it's not a food crop, uh, there's no restrictions on how many sprays can be used on it. Mm -hmm. So most cotton is really toxic and really mm -hmm. creating a toxic condition for the soil. Mm -hmm. Very often, peanuts are crop rotated with cotton, which makes peanuts somewhat questionable too mm -hmm. in their safety if they're not organic. Um, we also know that hemp could be used to make um, homes and make mm -hmm. fireproof homes that are breathable. Yeah. So that's another product. 
Um, we are cutting down old growth forests mm. to make newspapers, uh, trees that take you know decades to grow, yeah. whereas hemp renews in three to four months. Three to four months. Three to four yeah. months, okay? Yeah. And not to mention that hemp seed provides a food. It's the second highest source of vegetable protein next to soybeans, mm. but it's much easier to digest. So we could be using hemp seed to make hemp milk and a protein, protein powder. We could be using it as a nut and seed. Um, and not to mention all of the medicinal properties that are being found and have long been known as um, medicine that uh, many of the components in hemp, whether it be CBD, THC, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth, have been used to calm things like anxiety and help sleep, reduce inflammation. And so this plant has really been uh, persecuted and prosecuted for mm -hmm. many years. And yet this is a plant that can solve many, many of the problems on our planet. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to smoke cannabis. No. Um, but we know that Henry Ford built a car out of hemp. Mm -hmm. And it was fueled on hemp. And it's stronger than steel. It mm. can resist mm. impact more than steel. Think of how many minerals we're extracting from the earth yeah. when it could all be done above ground with a minimal amount of pollution. So when I think of a plant that could really save the world, I'm going to say hemp can save the world. Yeah. And uh, it's also interesting that we actually have a system in our bodies called the endocannabinoid system that somehow our bodies seem to have evolved with this plant. And, um, you know, as you mentioned in the Bible, they talk about the holy anointing oil mm -hmm. uh, that is mentioned in the Old Testament, that it was made from olive oil, cinnamon, myrrh, and cannabosum. Mm -hmm. And in a translation, a Greek translation in the Septuagint, I hope I pronounced that right, um, in the third century BC, they translated the kenebosum to be calamus, mm. a chorus calamus, which is um, probably not the plant that was used in the holy anointing oil. It doesn't have the same medicinal benefits. And the Bible also refers to cane mm. as a fiber plant, mm -hmm. and calamus is not a fiber plant. Mm. So there's a lot of scholars, botanists, rabbis, you know, uh, priests who are saying, hey, it's not a chorus calamus. So that's a huge misstep. And yet, even though the cannabis plant is legal in many states, it's still in prison in a sense. It's yes. the female plants yes. that are being grown indoors with electricity mm -hmm. and fluoridated water. And so I really feel to move into this age of uh, regeneration and healing the planet that we're going to have to free the plant. Um, and let it grow outdoors with sunlight and wind. Yeah. And I know that's going to really shape shift the economy, but what if there was free food and fiber growing everywhere yeah. for people? And one other thing about hemp that you often don't hear about is it grows very tall and it produces seeds that the birds could be eating in the winter, mm. which encourages the birds to nest nearby. Mm. And then the birds help you by eating more insects in the warmer months. So it really is a plant that could help, not to mention that the leaves provide fertilizer, yeah. uh, that it is one of the most ancient fiber crops that grows as tall as a tree in one season. It's pretty mm. remarkable. And again, I realize that we've t we're turning it into a drug. Mm. Um, and I don't know if that's really, you know, that's a whole nother discussion. Yeah. But when I think of all the environmental uh, concerns that we have here, there's one plant that could do so many things. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm hearing more and more commercial farmers are now uh, incorporating hemp into their production cycles uh, because it is actually helping their economics and allowing them to get away from a lot of the chemical inputs that they've been using. And we're hearing more and more farmers, farmers growing 20, 30,000 acres of things like uh, wheat and hay out in places like Utah who are now making the switch back to organic, because of course organic's not a fad, right? This is what we've been doing for hundreds and thousands of years. It's only the last couple generations we've been conducting this experiment. And uh, so many of these conventional farmers, several of them are fifth, sixth generation, are converting back to organic and incorporating hemp into their um, production cycles. And it's doing amazing things for their viability as small family businesses. And, you know, even here in the state of Colorado, where we legalized cannabis a few years ago, 
um, it, it is good for the economy. It's mm -hmm. bringing um, not only tourism, but there's many places, people that are employed in this industry. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of creativity going yeah. on. And, um, but I'm always into education about plants and I'm certainly not condoning um, being abusive with anything. I think right. with every plant, we yeah. need to learn what its functions are, when it's appropriate to use it. Um, I certainly wouldn't use golden seal every day. Right. Yeah. Well, speaking of abusing plants, you know, um, I've shared that I'm, I'm part uh, Native American, Mohawk Indian. And of course, tobacco is this incredibly sacred plant uh, to many of the uh, quote unquote new world tribal peoples. And I was addicted to tobacco smoking cigarettes for many, many years. I started as a teenager, as a lot of people do. And then um, it was about uh, 12 or so years ago that I finally quit. And Brigitte, I'm just, I'm really curious. I think more and more of us are waking up to the role of addiction in our lives and what we can do proactively to overcome some of those patterns. And what, what are some of the essential insights and even recommendations that you make in your book that deals with addiction, if you if you could share with us about that. Surely. Well, I wrote a book called Addiction Free Naturally, mm -hmm. because I think very often in our quest to get well, if we don't address the things like we're drinking too much coffee, eating too much sugar, still smoking, still drinking, you, maybe even a prescription drug, mm -hmm. we could be undermining our health and all the supplements and herbs and yoga is yeah. not going to yeah. help us to achieve balance. So um, one thing I think would be very helpful is to bring back the art of doing handicrafts with mm -hmm. our hands. If we were to go back to our ancestry, you know, um, the men and women were doing things with wood and metal, with fiber, with fabric. Maybe the women were inside making a quilt or knitting socks and the men were out on the porch making, you know, knife handles or cradle boards or, or something. Uh, uh, rocking chairs or something mm, like mm, that mm, and mm. so it seems like we've let go of doing things with our hands and making things with your hands is good for your self-esteem yeah. and you create things of beauty that have lasting value yeah. I mean if I make a quilt for my children it's not going to end up in a yard sale that's mm. like an heirloom yeah. and it's made with you know mama love or yeah. papa love yeah. and I and sketching could be a craft playing an instrument rather yeah. than just yeah listening to music, like doing something with our hands. And we also know that um, we need to find other ways to reward ourselves. Yeah. So rather than thinking, oh, I was really good today, I deserve a drink or I deserve a smoke. Um, and again, I know that tobacco can be used in ceremony and sure. celebration in, yeah. a, in a sacred way. I, use a, I was a tobacco smoker myself mm -hmm. for years. Uh, that um, what are other ways to reward ourselves? Maybe yeah. reading a novel, reading a magazine, calling a friend on the telephone. Yes. Um, nice. Maybe um, going for a walk. Um, oh, a you know, doing one. yoga, yeah. spending time in the garden. Um, so it's so th those are just a few things. But we also know that being more alkaline uh, and eating those green leafy vegetables can make us more. Uh, you know, able to stay on track and not overindulge in anything yeah. that undermines our health. I love it. It's um, there are so many pathways to enhanced health and well-being. And on the topic of making things with our hands, you know, of course, Gandhi really emphasized this notion of swadeshi, how important it is for us to be able to make things in our own homes and our own communities. And I'm struck that our word manufacture mm. comes from the Latin manus for hand and facto to make. Oh. So manufacture means to make by hand. Mm. And, uh, or at least that's the origin, the etymology of our word. Um, and I'm struck that one of the, as you were describing this, one of the things I love making by hand, as you know, are these um, hemp infused bathing salts that I've been making to share with people. Love them. Waylay waters. And... We actually, I started doing this about a year ago in part because of the classes I was taking from you, Brigitte, and I was creating these different uh, aromatherapy blends with a hemp-infused base, organic coconut oil. I was sharing them with friends and family, and then suddenly I was hearing from people, hey, can I get some more of that? It helped with my back or with my arthritis, yes. or I've been able to cut back on my sleeping medication, my mm -hmm. goodness, and uh, realized 
um, we were uh, talking with Artem and uh, realized, my gosh, this might be a little cottage industry thing we could do uh, to help support the work at the Y on Earth community. And so uh, for me to be able to sit there for a few hours and make a batch, the level of, of joy and peace and really tranquility I feel during and after that process is remarkable. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what a gift. And here, here we're just making things to share with people. Um, I, I, I don't know, Brigitte, I think you've hit on something there that could be a whole nother uh, topic of discussion even perhaps in addition to what we might do with our relationship with plants and herbal medicine in terms of helping heal our planet and ourselves. This uh, working with our hands seems really important. It's so simple. And I also think that not working with our hands is another contributing factor to losing our mental faculties because yeah. there's a yeah. big connection between the hands and the brain. So um, it's also a great stress relieving technique. Yeah. But we also know that um, many people that have addictive tendencies have blood sugar issues. Mm -hmm and eating things like drinking lots of fruit juice and eating white flour products and sugar can also make us be in that loop of uh, stimulate, sedate, stimulate, sedate. So uh, using herbs like cinnamon and fennel and anise and there's a lot of things that we can do to help addiction rather than just, you know, only use willpower. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's so important. Brigitte, I am so... Uh humbled and overjoyed to have this time with you and i know you have been teaching hundreds thousands of people uh in our community around here and all around the world and uh you are in my humble opinion a, a living treasure oh thank you so much and, and i so appreciate what you do and i love welle waters they are amazing so yes we have them at our house and they make a big difference that's wonderful. There is a, if you want, waylaywaters.com, there is a free download soaking ceremony guide. Check it out. You'll have fun. You'll feel good. And that's another way to reward yourself. It is. You know, yeah. rather than you, you deserve a break today. Well, an aromatherapy bath with these wonderful salts. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, I just, Brigitte, I want to thank you for being with us today. I really encourage all of you out there, audience, to check out brigittemars.com. An incredible wealth of resources are there waiting for you. And remember to use the code Brigitte Mars if you would like to get some discounts on some of the products we're offering through whyonearth.org. And again, it's B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E-M-A-R-S, like the planet. And uh, blessings. Thank you so much, Brigitte. Thank you, Aaron, cameraman, Artem. Many blessings to you. All right, we can do this. Let's make the world a better place. Aho. Uh -huh.